everybody. My name is Angie Vishianen, and I'm the founder of Leg Up Legal. We provide a mentoring program that connects prospective law students to lawyers for mentoring to help them learn more about the legal profession before they dive headfirst into law school. And we started doing these Zoom meetups at the beginning of COVID-19 to connect pre-law students, current law students, and young lawyers so that you could all get information about things that might help you profession and learn about law school admissions and various topics like managing stress and wellness and just how to get through this crazy pandemic time. So um, I'm really excited to invite all these guest speakers on every week to chat with you guys. And today I have Kristen Corpian and she's the founder of her own law firm, um, Corp Law. And she is going to talk to you guys today about job searching because it's on so many people's minds. So Kristen, I'll let you take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Like Angie mentioned, my name is Kristen Corpian, and I am going to be speaking with you today about the job search and providing you some unique tips. Before we start, a little bit about me in terms of background. I graduated from Berkeley Law. I've been practicing law at this point for seven years. My slide needs to be updated. And I started my career at a large law firm in Miami, Florida, out of, right out of law school as a commercial litigator. I have since opened and launched my own firm. We're headquartered in downtown Brickell area uh, in South Florida, and we specialize in protecting and supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs on the legal side as outside general counsel. So I am a business attorney, uh, but that means a lot of things. That's not so much the focus of today's call, um, but I love what I do, and as a result of being an entrepreneur and an attorney, I'm able to have some flexibility in my schedule, which allows for me to pursue some hobbies that I enjoy very much, and one of those is teaching. I see some of my students on the call here, so hello and welcome. Um, I've had the pleasure at this point to teach pre-law classes, and I've taught at the law school level as well, uh, advanced legal research and writing, classes on business and law. Um, and now at the undergraduate level, I teach a year-long course that is everything you wish you would have known before going to law school. So we cover a lot. And today we're going to zoom in on the job application process and some tips that I have uh, for you guys. Before we do that, I am a lawyer, but I am not lo your lawyer. So surprise, surprise, lawyer with a disclaimer. It's what we have to do. Um, to the extent that you need any legal advice, that advice should be customized for you. So please don't rely on anything I'm saying as a legal representation, because it is not that. So you've heard a little bit about my resume, but I'm not a person who is much impressed by resumes. I think much more interesting to every individual and human being is their personal why. So I'm quickly going to give you mine and we're going to loop this back around into a conversation of why your personal why needs to come out in the job application process. But for me, why am I here giving my time to this talk? Why do I enjoy working with pre-law students has a lot to do with my background. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I'm the first person in my family to be an attorney. And I'm the, I started uh, working at 15 years old to support my family. So we are very much a working class um, background. And I put myself through college working multiple jobs. I worked multiple jobs in law school. And I really felt like I navigated the process of going through law school on my own. I had support and love from my family, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And I didn't have a program like Angie's or mentorship and support like they offer. And so I found myself very lost in juggling everything. And so now that I am much less lost and I enjoy what I'm doing and I have a sense of what it means to be an attorney, giving back and working with students who are going through that process means a lot to me. And it makes me feel good as a human being to get to mentor um, younger professionals, whether that be young attorneys or pre-law students. And so for me, the personal why that brings me here today is remembering what that process feels like um, and wanting you as listeners to avoid having to 
kind of step on some of the landmines that I myself stepped on and help you in that process. So that's me. What are we going to talk about today? First, who is this presentation for? For lawyers starting out their career, law students, pre-law students, I think there are some tidbits in here that would be helpful for anyone looking for a job in any industry, but we're going to focus very specifically on those pursuing a legal career. And then what are we going to cover? We're going to cover the state of the legal market and mindset, and then the core topic that drew you here, actually landing the job. I've got some asterisks there because I need your help and I need your patience. Um, if you are a person who is in the thick of the job search, you may have some very specific questions. Understand that this presentation is high level, it's broad. There may be things that you wish I would spend the next hour talking about, but I won't be able to. So I will promise you that if there is anything I can help you with in the future, I would be happy to do so. Um, but understand that this presentation is designed to be a little bit more general and there'll be an opportunity for more specific questions at the end. All right, so usually where lawyers start with any analysis is logic and numbers. And we want to know in the face of a pandemic, what do the numbers tell us? How many jobs exist? What are the trends? If you thought I was going to present you specific numbers, I am not. I'm going to, no one really has the numbers, honestly. Uh, the numbers understand, tell us what they have always told us, right? At least in recent times, within, you know, since post 2008 times. Um, the lawyers tell us that there is a downward trend in terms of your ability to find jobs. There are more lawyers being produced than the available jobs. That's what the ABA statistics usually show. But there is a number that is more concerning to me always, and it's this one. Any version of um, statistical reporting on the happiness of lawyers. And usually it's a high kind of frame of most lawyers would change careers. And I feel like as we talk about the job search, there has to be a starting place with, we want to produce lawyers and happy lawyers who are pursuing jobs that they want, that they enjoy. So you don't fall into this ugly statistic. And so while we're not going to focus on it, and while I know others have covered it, this question of do you even want to practice law is essential to you finding and landing the dream job. If you're not sure about this, if you're on the fence, if you don't know your personal why, those who are interviewing you are going to be able to ferret that out. It's very obvious when somebody is only in the room interviewing for a job because they just need a job and they don't really care about the position and they don't care about the work and there is no passion reflected in the interview because it's not genuinely there. So to the extent that you haven't asked yourself this question, do you even want to practice law? What's your personal why? What do you genuinely enjoy? You need to do that. Don't skip over it. Listen to other presentations on this topic. It's really essential. And to the extent you skip over it and you think that you have won something by doing so, you haven't. Uh, and those who are interviewing you will probably get a sense that you haven't spent the time there that you need. And unfortunately, I think a lot of folks who do skip over that analysis end up being in those ugly statistics of being unhappy lawyers who want to change their careers because they're not doing what makes them happy. So the numbers in that way make sense. So get your mindset right. Invest the time into figuring out what you want to do. Make sure that that's actually the practice of law and understand that the law is still um, a business right? You are in a service industry, but most of the time you as an attorney are on the production line of a business. A business has a lot of different pieces, uh, marketing, business development, operations, financials. Good businesses a lot of times don't let attorneys, um, they don't need their attorneys to be involved in the other pieces of the business. And so sometimes there is a misunderstanding from those in the job search process about what the job requirements for them actually are. What do I mean by that? 
if you're a person who sees yourself more entrepreneurial, maybe things like being out in the community, doing speaking gigs, landing new clients, uh, business development, marketing, branding, these elements of the legal profession excite you. If you're that person, you need to be careful in looking for jobs um, to find the type of job that would allow you to do those roles. If you're applying to jobs where they need someone purely on production line, which means producing legal deliverables, and they really don't need help with business development or marketing or you out in the community, they need a workhorse, then you've got a misalignment between the type of job you're applying to and what you are interested in doing on a day to day basis. So you really want to be thinking through those things. And again, in order to run that type of assessment, you've got to know what excites you, what characteristics you're looking for in a job. And then once you know those, you got to roll up your sleeves and fight for obtaining that type of job that's going to get you all those things rather than fall into this trap of I'll take whatever job I can get. There are a lot of um, a lot of places you can look for support in figuring this out. Of course, Angie is a phenomenal place to to be looking and we're preaching to the choir because you're here getting educated on this. But there are other places that will help you in terms of this introspection that needs to be done. Uh, and I highly recommend doing these kind of soft skill things, uh, these fluffy type of activities. I think lawyers tend to focus on logic and discount the um, emotion and the kind of introspective piece of this. So be honest with yourself and do what you need to do to figure out what types of jobs are going to be a right fit for you. Uh, rather than work in reverse and just apply to any job without having a real connection to it. Okay, so assuming you have done the introspective thing and you are certain practicing law is for you and you could decide, look, I want to be on production line or maybe there's something different that I want, more of an alternative legal career. You've got that ready to go. Now, how do we get the job? What do we do? A lot of what I am receiving uh, from students is these types of comments, right? In a pandemic, I can't, the market is crap, jobs are sparse, competition is fierce, right? I can't, I can't get a job because of all of these reasons. This is victim mentality, guys. And the truth is the job market hasn't been great for lawyers, for new lawyers for some time now. And so, even if this negativity is correct, right? You're right. The numbers support what you're saying. So what? Right? We can't do nothing. We can't quit. We've got to move forward. And so I want us to do three things in the process as we're moving forward. And the prerequisite is let's get our mindset correct. Right? The negativity isn't going to help us in any way. So we've got to be positive about this. And the process, once you understand it, is one that can be fun and like the title says, not suck. And we're gonna talk about how to make that happen. So the practical things you should be doing to land a job include growing and engaging your network, treating the job search as a job, and then there's a sort of X factor that we're gonna talk about at the end, which is bringing a certain level of creativity into this process that a lot of folks miss. Well, let's kind of dive into all three of those. In terms of growing and engaging your network, something I like to say to my students is there are two ways to get to the top of the resume pile in the job search. One, have the best grades and credentials, right? You got all A's and you graduated from the best schools and you've got the best recommenders. The other way is know the person reviewing the resume pile and that person likes you and knows you and cherry picks your name out of the list. The point being, we cannot discount that the role networking or better said relationship building plays in the job search process. 
So I want you to think about networking, not as an ugly word, not as a word to be scared of, but as this process of building mutually beneficial relationships where both parties add value to the other. You're not trying to take anything from someone. You're not a sleazy salesperson. You're looking for ways to support them. And in so doing, they'll do the same for you. And why, why do we network, right? For a lot of reasons. There's the strategic one, right? We wanna build these mutually beneficial relationships. Um, but there are other reasons. You can actually make friendships by doing this networking and you're gonna grow your network and your community and your ability to, um, to create impact and to build things. And sometimes those things are outside of the professional day-to-day -day job work that you do. How do you do this? Um, I spend a lot of time on this with my students who tend to understand the concept when it's presented. What is networking? Okay, I get it. I should be meeting people, maybe attend happy hours. I kind of genu uh, generally understand the definition, but I don't know how to make that happen, how to do it. I've not spent much time practicing this skill. And so what happens when we're learning a new skill, um, but it, it's foreign to us and um, we're not quite sure how to do it. As a result of fear, we make excuses and we avoid doing it. That's natural, it happens for all of us. And the truth is networking can be awkward. But the good news is um, it's a skill that can be learned. And to learn it, you've got to actually do it. So you want to start by creating a list of everyone you know and want to know. You can use tools like social media. LinkedIn is a very safe place to do networking, perhaps safer than Facebook or Instagram, which are considered more informal platforms. Maybe you don't want to send your uh, prospective employer an Instagram invite, um, Instagram request or follow, but sending them a, a LinkedIn invitation to connect is much more um, kind of permissible in our industry. And for most people would not be considered an odd thing to do. So we wanna be taking a survey of who is in our network, what organizations and opportunities do we have for networking? And then who do we wanna know and who can help us get connections to those people? And then create a plan of attack for reaching out to those folks. In the process of doing this networking, I want you to be careful not to pretend to be something you're not. Sometimes when I'm speaking with students and digesting with them why they don't want to network, why I've given to them all of these great people who have provided their contact information and offered to help and the student doesn't follow up. Sometimes I'm hit with the response of, I don't feel like I know enough to talk to a lawyer. I'm scared, I'm intimidated. I don't see how I can add value to them. And so I'm not engaging in the process. It's okay to come to the table as a student looking for help, as a junior lawyer looking for mentorship. You do not have to present yourself in this networking process on equal footing with the person that you're meeting. And in fact, doing so is gonna make you look bad. When I meet with you, when I meet with a student or a junior lawyer, I don't expect them to know as much as I would as a seventh year attorney. I'm not thinking in my mind I should question them at that way, in that way. Um, I'm expecting them to be at the level they're at depending on their own professional evolution. So we wanna make sure that you are not trying to present um, a picture of yourself that is inaccurate. If a lawyer brings up a case or uh, some kind of substantive topic that you don't know about, it's okay to say, I don't know, but that sounds interesting. I'd love to learn more. I'd love to read more about that case. I think we fall into this trap, especially if we have anyone on the line who's in law school, because it starts to pick up and get worse when we're in law school into this trap of always needing to have an answer. And law school does that to us a little bit, right? Because you might get thrown out of class if you don't come prepared. Um, but worse, I think, than not having an answer is 
lying about the correct answer or pretending like you know when you don't know. Uh, and that can really get you into some trouble, especially with very experienced practitioners who um, really do know what they're talking about. And if you present that you know as well, they may want to engage with you at a certain level and then you are going to look bad because you realistically just don't know it as well as they do. So be honest and be yourself. Another uh, kind of feedback that I get from students on or, or young professionals on why they're not networking, why they're skipping this essential step is this fear of contacting a person who's busy and being rejected by them. So what if they don't respond to me? What if I reach out on a cold uh, LinkedIn message or a cold email and they ignore me, right? You get shot down. For your networking efforts to be successful, uh, there's, an, there's some level of killing your ego, right? You're reaching out to someone for help. And if they don't get back to you, don't take it personally. It really has nothing to do with you individually. Perhaps they're busy. Uh, but the possibility of someone not responding to you really shouldn't be the reason that you don't participate in this networking process. Kristen, can I make a point on this one um, topic? So I just wanted to let everybody know when I was thinking about going to law school, I did exactly what Kristen suggests. I started trying to talk to a lot of lawyers about what their practice was like, you know, what their career paths were like. And I cold called over 50 lawyers and I only got to talk to three and I know those sound like terrible odds to a lot of students but I used to be in cold calling and sales so it didn't phase me at all but those are actually pretty good odds <laughs> for cold calling and the whole point I'm trying to make is that you only need one person to care about you to really change the game out of those three lawyers I talked to, one of those people became one of my key mentors and he completely changed my life. I mean, opened up a ton of doors for me. He hired me to work for him as an intern while I was applying to law school. He introduced me to dozens of lawyers and he was super active in the bar association. So he knew a whole bunch of people and everyone he introduced me to really wanted to help me because he was such a good relationship builder himself. And so really when he put his own credibility behind me, it completely changed the game. So I know it stinks being ignored. And, you know, I know it's scary reaching out to people and not hearing anything, but I promise you, like all it takes is just one or two people to respond that can really, really help. you. So um, don't be afraid if you reach out to 10 people and you get ignored. I mean, it does not, kill you. I promise you. Um, so yeah, take your ego out of the equation and just realize it may not be you exactly as Kristen said, you know, those people might be busy. I literally get at least 10 to 15 DMs a week from students that are completely cold. And I try to be really good at replying to all of them. But even sometimes I miss one and I come across one and I'm like, oh my God, it's been like a full month and I didn't respond to this person. And then I try to go back through and respond to them. But, you know, sometimes we miss stuff too. So, um, so forgive the people that you're reaching out to and they may really, really want to help you. They just might be really, really busy. And some people are good about telling you that and some people aren't, but um, all it takes is just one or two really influential people to help you. Um, so don't be discouraged if you reach out quite a few don't um, get a response. Or even if you get a response and they say like, I'm too busy right now, follow up with them again, make it easy on them, you know, in a month or so, reach out again and just say, hey, you know, I know a month ago you said you were busy. I wanted to wait until things died down a little bit for you. Do you maybe have some time now? But if you don't do that follow up, you're the one hurting your. So make sure that you follow through. Absolutely. And, and as you build this muscle and you build this skill, perspective will come with it. And so for, you know, for Angie or for somebody who is more experienced with this process, being shot down, being told no, it doesn't really sting as much. But when you're first starting out, it feels monumental because maybe you've identified, you know, somebody who you really, really want to connect with and their rejection, their lack of response, you take it personally. Uh, but as you get better at this and as you build a certain level of, of empathy and understanding, 
uh, around this process, you're going to think about networking differently. And that's really exciting when it starts to happen because then networking becomes a lot of fun. You're building relationships. You're not taking it personally. When somebody doesn't have the time, you're giving them empathy. Look, they're busy. Maybe they're having a bad week. Maybe they're having a bad year. We can connect in the future. No big deal. Uh, but you also start to see a universe of possibilities rather be, than being limited to um, kind of one idea of what the relationship can be. And that's where I'm going with my third tip here. When you're in the job um, application kind of process, you're a candidate applying to as many things as you can. The likelihood of you being told no more than you're told yes is very high. But understand that being told no for a job is not the same as being told never, right? We will never hire you. There is a possibility that maybe you're second place and in the onboarding and training process of the person who did get the job, something happens and they're cut from the position. If you didn't remain professional, if you didn't keep the opportunities open for a continued relationship or worse, you burnt the bridge, then the opportunity to be the number two now advanced to number one doesn't exist for you. And this is something I wish I would have understood when I was in law school. In law school, you get the opportunity to do this weird thing, uh, depending on your school, called OCI, where you're interviewing with a lot of different firms. And I understand that each law school does this differently, but whether you're doing OCI or not, you're meeting with a lot of people, usually in the market that you wanna practice. And when I was in, in law school, I was thinking about this in a narrow-minded way. And when I was rejected, my feelings were hurt. And I thought, man, we were vibing. We were doing so well in the interview. You were sharing all this personal stuff. I was sharing this personal stuff. I thought we had something going and then you rejected me. In my mind, that, that meant that's it, we're done. They don't want me, I can't talk to them anymore. And that's really not true. If you're feeling like you're vibing with someone, they might not be the end decision maker, one. And maybe even if you're rejected, you were vibing with them. They just didn't kind of pick you for the win. You can continue building a relationship afterwards. And what I don't mean by that is make them uncomfortable and say, why didn't you hire me? Because that's awkward. <laughs> what I'm saying is think about the long game. Think about having that relationship for the future. OCI and the interview process is just opening a door for you to meet a lot of people. What you do with that open door has a lot more possibility than simply getting the job. So I want you to think creatively about networking and then it becomes, like I said, a lot of fun. Don't use any of these excuses. Um, the biggest one I hear that is really hard for me to hear just considering how busy I am running multiple companies and teaching is I don't have time to network. That's BS. You're, not, you're only gonna get busier, right? I know you feel busy as a student. I know you feel busy as a law student but you're only gonna get busier and busier as time goes on. So don't give yourself that excuse. And the reality is those who are spending their time doing this due diligence, doing the networking, building the relationships, they're gonna outpace you if you don't also put in the time. So build it into your schedule and don't use the excuse that you're too busy. Also, don't use the pandemic or COVID as an excuse. Again, I'm gonna call BS on it. What mindset matters and your ability to see opportunity is key. One of the unique thing that's, things that's happening with kind of COVID and the pandemic is people are um, in some ways less busy or busy in a different way, um, but you're able to maybe get on somebody's calendar for networking that you maybe wouldn't have been able to before. And even the process of if you're doing a Zoom meeting with someone in their home, look at what's in the background on the screen. Do they have football memorabilia? Do they have, you know, a lot of Disney stuff? You have this unique insight into someone's home and personal life. Is there a dog barking in the background? That creates an opportunity for conversation. 
I see a lot of, you know, unique football stuff back there. Are you a big football fan? And now you know something that's really deeply important to that person because it's in their home and you understand why, and you can build a bit more of a meaningful relationship with them than sometimes the superficial stuff that comes out when you're suited up in an office and you might not see those personal details. So see the pandemic, see anything that's thrown at you as an opportunity rather than an excuse not to participate. All right, number two, I want you to be strategic about the job process. Kind of everyone looks, looks at the, the simple process, right? We need our resume, we need our cover letter, we need to have the appropriate um, job documents. And I agree that that's important, but I want you to do better, right? I want you to customize these documents for each position. I want you to have as many people vet these documents as possible. Um, and I want you to avoid doing the kind of general data dump that doesn't customize the documents and show a genuine interest in the position. Uh, a lot of um, departments that are reviewing resumes and cover letters they want somebody who's going to stand out and it's very hard to stand out with stock language and job descriptions are giving you little gems of information that you can use to win the job and to the extent you don't kind of pick out those little gems and customize them in your application. It's just an opportunity missed. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about something else you should be looking for in the job descriptions as well in a moment. To the extent you have extra free time on your hands, um, use this time to continue boosting your resume, right? Pick up extra skills. If you are a law student or you're a young attorney, maybe do some pro bono work, offer to volunteer. You're gonna be doing double duty when that happens, picking up new skills, networking, um, and that's certainly a good thing to do. In the process, I want you to make sure that you have a little database with where you're applying um, and, and the results of the application and all this good stuff. I think that some students and some candidates get so intense about applying that maybe they've submitted a thousand applications and they forget applications they've submitted and then perhaps they resubmit or everything gets jumbled and maybe you send like a resume and cover letter titled to one firm to another, the incorrect firm. Um, you just wanna make sure that whatever, you come up with a system and you're organized so, uh, it, so you don't do anything that would be offensive to somebody reading your application. Input the wrong name, follow up with them, you know, three times because you forgot, you followed up the other two times. So just be careful and be organized. In terms of where to look for jobs, I feel like this is pretty low hanging fruit. Google apply to all of the um, different job search websites and don't skip this last one. Ask your network for introductions to the extent that you're going the big firm corporate route. These job positions are usually posted and published in a way that's pretty easy to find. To the extent you're working with a midsize or small firm, their process for sharing information might be very different. Um, I recently, literally just last week, onboarded a new full-time hire and we did not post a job announcement at all, anywhere for the position. What I did was I uh, sent an email to my personal network and the people that I know and my personal listserv. I told them what I was looking for um, and they sent me referrals. And the first place that I wanted to look as the CEO of my company is within people, within my network of people I already trust. And then if that didn't yield results, then we were gonna publish the job posting. So there may be opportunities out there, you're looking for, you're, you're searching through traditional methods, you might not see them. But had uh, somebody been doing their networking and shared with one of my contacts that they were looking for the type of position my firm was hiring for, they would have found out about the position in that way. So again, we want to be creative in the job search. 
Okay, and that was my tip there. No job posting doesn't mean no jobs, right? So in this instance, I didn't post a job listing, but there was a job. Also, there have been times when candidates have sort of beaten down my firm's door. They call, they email, and they are so genuinely excited about what we're doing that I, you know, I'm not so far removed since we're a small business from being able to talk to them and their eagerness and their enthusiasm could lead to me creating a position for them. So understand that even if a company doesn't have a position listed, sometimes for the right candidate, a position could be created. And this is again, where thinking creatively and thinking differently might just land you the job. The other thing that I wanted to mention, I said I would circle back to, is that job description, like I mentioned, is giving you gems of information that's really important. And one thing you don't want to look over is uh, hidden tests that exist in the job application process. So I have one listed for you here on, uh, on the slide that my firm uses. And that is buried at the bottom of job descriptions we ask our candidates to do something to kind of overcome a request so that we know they're paying attention to detail, they're careful readers, and they're really taking this seriously. We will not open an application or look at it if it doesn't satisfy the test. I think that from the standpoint of a candidate looking for a job, that feels harsh. But understand that if you're not willing to take the job seriously enough, and if you were to represent, I pay attention to detail, I'm careful, and then you miss this test or you get it wrong, it really does display to the employer that you're not taking it so seriously, and maybe you don't pay as much attention to detail as we would prefer. And so this is an example, is an example that we use with law clerks but there are different variations of tests that employers may bury in the process for you. And if you see some of these tests and you recoil from them and you're like, screw this, I'm not willing to do this, I'm not playing ball, I'm not willing to jump through hoops for this job. I don't think that that means that there's anything wrong with you as a person, you're probably great. But I think that's something inside you telling you that you don't care enough about the job to be willing to do what it takes to get the position. And so it's not the job for you. You need to find the type of work that excites you enough that you're willing to jump through whatever hoop you need to jump through within reason, of course, to get that job. So that's my note about that. All right, I think that should be a number three. So excuse my typo. Number three and last thing we're going to close out with is this idea of an X factor. So in addition to a great resume and a great cover letter and great writing samples and doing the job of applying to as many places as you can, there's this X factor to consider and work into the job application process. The X factor things I want you to be thinking about is creativity, right? I think that law students, as a result of the curve, tend to start being scarcity mindset about things. Only so many people in the class can get an A, so I can't share anything with anybody else because I need to hoard the opportunity for myself. This is a terrible mindset for professional development and professional growth, even if you're a lawyer. There is an opportunity to work with your peers and help them and receive their support as well. So this is an example of creativity. What about the possibility of looping somebody in, maybe a competitor, maybe somebody wants the same job as you and helping each other with the job search, right? This concept of a job search wing person. It's one example, um, but understand that this abundance mindset and helping others in the job search might pay dividends and help you in return if somebody returns that favor. So don't go into the process alone, offer help, and you'll probably receive a lot of it in return. And that can include your own peer group. So I think looking at them as competitors is the wrong way to do this. 
The other thing is be flexible. There is, I think, differing mindsets on willingness to work at an unpaid internship or not. I'm not going to get into bed on that conversation. Uh, but no, I've seen some folks really get their foot in the door by being willing to maybe take a position that's not exactly what they want and become so valuable to the team that they eventually are uh, advanced to or moved into the position that they want. So to the extent you're very rigid in, look, I need to be a patent attorney in Silicon Valley making this much money on day one, period, done. Fine, I respect you valuing yourself the way you want to, but understand that some additional creativity may get you that job uh, rather than you being rigid about you know, only applying to what is the perfect job opportunity for you. On that point, Kristen, um, can, I think they should also be open to applying for jobs that are like project-based or short-term jobs, contract jobs. You know, I think a lot of students are out there looking for these long-term first-year associate positions and many of those are disappearing right now, especially in this time when law firms really can't make a lot of long-term decisions because they just don't know what their demand is going to look like for the next year. And so they're really hesitant to hire, you know, a first-year associate that they're going to pay $190,000 to right out of the gate and they're stuck with you for a year. Um, so I've found that a lot of students are having success with proposing project-based assignments you know, and saying, hey, I'm willing to come work for you so that you can try me out if, um, you know, you want me to work on some discrete project, like, you know, for my area of law, filing a trademark application or helping you with a response to an office action or something like that, where they're trying you out and you're trying them out, um, that could get your foot in the door. You know, be creative, like Kristen said, and be willing to propose a couple of different ways that they can work with you so that you can just you know, get them to get to know you, and then that could lead to another opportunity down the line. Absolutely. And then understand that good employers, you know, ones who really care, they also feel a certain level of fear, you know, um, as a standpoint uh, from a, a small business owner who's kind of growing their business, uh, I don't want to have to lay someone off. I don't want to have to, you know, fire someone because the firm isn't profitable enough as a result of COVID or something else. And so what Angie's, you know, saying sounds very good to me as an owner, you know, it's like I need help and I want to start working with you. Maybe I'm not yet ready to commit to a full-time salary job, but if you present an eagerness and willingness to do project by project, there remains the possibility that we adjust that into full-time work. And to the extent you came to the table with just hire me full time or that's it, then maybe the response is, I'm sorry, I just don't have need for that at this time. So absolutely be creative and be humble. And this kill your ego is always going to be a theme for me to be excellent at this process of seeking a job. The more perspective you have and the more insight you have into what an employer needs, the better you can present that to them and make a persuasive pitch for yourself getting the job. So the research that you do and the understanding that you have of your role in the business is really going to come out in the interview process and help you um, along the way. So do a lot of research and understand to the extent that you don't the business of law and where your role is going to fit in the overall business. And I mean that even if you're looking at nonprofits or government work, right? It might not be a business in the traditional sense, but the, the systems are going to be there and the where you sit on the production line in an organization is still going to matter. And to the extent you have a strong sense of that, you can convince somebody to hire you to perform. So know what the employer needs. Understand that a positioning yourself, uh, desiring to make their lives easier will help you. Um, and for interviews, right, just quick tips. There is no such thing as over preparing or being overdressed. I performed a Zoom interview for some law clerks at the kind of beginning and crux of COVID-19. 
Um, and there were several students who did not join the Zoom meeting in suits and they were late to the Zoom meeting. Uh, and usually those two things alone are enough to get a no from most law firms. So formality that you would do in an in-person interview still matters on Zoom. So you definitely wanna take that Zoom etiquette as we're kind of dialing into this new digital age. And you wanna make sure that in COVID times or non-COVID times, you follow up. I think that there are different, differing opinions on the formal handwritten card after an interview. I don't necessarily personally think you need to do a formal handwritten card, um, but a digital thank you for the interview, I'm very interested in the position and maybe some personalization to that is one of those things that I'll tell you if my firm doesn't get, it's a ding against the candidate. So do with that information what you will. All right. I don't know if you want to switch, Angie, to any Q&A. Um, and maybe if we have time, I can hit on just that last topic, which was, all right, once you land the job, how do you keep it? Yeah. Um, well, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. But I want to make sure that you guys get all the great information that Kristen has. So why don't you go ahead and jump in? jump into the last topic, Kristen, and then as the questions come up, if we need to answer some, then we can just look in the chat. Okay, happy to. Okay. So once you land the job, then what do you do? How do you keep the job once you get it? And this is the subject of a whole, you know, many hours and days worth of conversation, but some high level things I want you to consider. That, uh, topic of perspective and knowing what the employer needs is a thread that you then pull through as a starting employee at a company. You have to understand how to make the job of your boss uh, and the team easier and how to make yourself indispensable. And that concept is thrown out there a lot, but I find that a lot of young lawyers and students don't understand what it means. I, I want to be indispensable, but you just don't know how to make that happen. And a lot of times that ignorance comes from not understanding how the organization operates. It's the lack of perspective and it's understandable. Um, but to wrap your head around it, I really encourage you to do research on how the organization operates on the business side, you know, in terms of numbers. If you're an associate at a big firm, your salary is not the product of your employer wanting to be nice and pay you six figures or whatever they're paying you because they just pulled that number out of a hat. It's based on how expensive it is to run the firm, cost of operation, market numbers. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it and businesses don't just pay people to be kind. They pay you with the expectation of you producing a profit for the company. And that P word profit tends to be an ugly word for lawyers. We don't wanna talk about making money because we're a service industry and we just love being lawyers. But quite frankly, no business, legal or otherwise, can operate without turning a profit. So you need to know in terms of the metrics, how are you profitable to the business? A lot of times for hourly based firms, that's rooted in your numbers. If you produce 2000 hours worth of a legal service on the production line per year, you're profitable. Whatever that X is, you need to understand it rather than hide from it and pretend it doesn't exist. And to the extent you're not satisfying those metrics, you need to have a conversation with your employers sooner rather than later. You know, look, you're not assigning me enough work to meet my annual goals. Don't say it that way, but be thinking about what you need to do in order to sort of satisfy these goals and be a profitable member of the team. The other point for keeping the job is make sure as a young lawyer, you're tying things up with the bow is my way of putting it. If your supervisor asks you to do something, Try to do as much of it as possible rather than ping-ponging it, a piece of it, back to their desk. And this is a hard thing to learn because you don't know what you don't know. And so you, I think as a young lawyer, might think, 
well, I did a great job doing this one little research project. In order for you to truly be invaluable, you want to display your ability to think through a project long term. You do a research project, but how does that matter in the overall context of what your boss needs to produce? To the extent you understand that, you can start to anticipate your boss's needs and hand it to them on a silver platter so that they don't have to worry about it as much. You build trust, and that's part of making yourself indispensable um, on a legal team. And then and I last- I that we have a couple of questions that actually tie into the topic that you're talking, discussing. So um, what are some tips on maintaining an open mind um, to opportunities outside of your ideal plans when you're in such a competitive field? Okay, so maintaining a positive attitude when, sorry, say that piece again, Andrew. Um, what are some tips on maintaining an open mind to opportunities outside of like your set plan? <laughs> sure. Uh, for, for this one, I think it depends in my mind on how far outside of your set plan it is. I, my personal value system as a human being is that people should do what they're truly passionate about and go forcefully in that direction. So if you absolutely want to be a commercial litigator, but the only job you can find is a transactional job where you're going to have zero litigation opportunity, and you just take that job to take the job, I don't support it. And I say this as somebody who has financially always needed a job. I don't say that ignorant to the need to make money. I say that if you take that other job and there's no passion for it and you genuinely want to do something else, it's going to show up to your employers. It's going to show up to the way you feel when you get out of bed in the morning and your work product is going to suffer because it's just not what you want to do. So if you're veering that far off track just to make a couple bucks, I'm concerned for you and I honestly wouldn't recommend it, but that has a lot to do with my personal value system. I want you to get that thing you want. But if it's a slighter variation and maybe you're not getting, maybe you take a job at a transactional firm and you tell them your interest and your goals and they tell you, look, we've only got transactional work right now, but we anticipate in the next six months getting a bunch of litigation, opening a litigation practice, and we want to put you in that position. So we just need you to wait a little bit, put, put in some time and learn. Then I'm more okay with it. So I don't know if that's where the question is going, but I personally would not recommend veering off of your kind of personal course fully. Yeah, and I think again, on being, you know, different ways to be creative and keeping an open mind, you could also think about, okay, what are the types of things that I can do to build skills for what I ideally want to do? Are there positions that I could get in the interim that will help me build the skills that I will need for the ideal job that I want um, whether, you know, it's short term or what. Um, but you can think about it as, you know, how do I find a creative way to move myself towards these goals, however I can. Um, and I think that that will, you know, unlock any like hesitation that you might have to choose things that are not your ideal job. Um, Kristen, there's another question in the chat box. How do you become indispensable as a pre-law student and not yet a law student? in an internship. And I think you talked about some of these skills, but can you maybe give some more context for pre-law students? Sure. So uh, as a, as a pre-law student, your employer, let's say you're working at a law firm, they don't need you to be an attorney. They're not going to ask you to be an attorney. Um, so understand that it's not your job to produce legal deliverables. But as a pre-law student, what you would want to be presenting to your employer is that uh, you are thinking about problems in the type of way an attorney would, right? And you're thinking about problems and proposing solutions. There is a type of job that allows you to kind of turn off and automate. You do things on rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat without really thinking through the problem so much. And I think a lot of the types of jobs that undergrads are able to get are types of jobs where they're just asking you to do maybe one thing over and over and not think about it too much. What you want to display to your employer is an interest in more complex problem solving. And so I'll give you some examples that I've seen. Um, if we have a pre-law student working on our team and we ask them to 
edit a contract in terms of just find typos. We want you to take a look at it and read it and see if there's any typos in there, right? We're not asking you to write it and give it to a client. The type of effort they put into that process and looking through it and asking questions and coming to us and saying, wow, I really enjoyed that. And when I was reading it, I was kind of wondering, what do I do about this? And why did you write this this way? And what happens in this instance? It is really displaying to the employer that you thought about the process. You didn't just do what was being asked of you, find the typos, run it through Grammarly and that's it. You thought about it, you cared enough to have a conversation and advanced analysis and solution finding is what lawyers do. So in the legal context, that's the type of thing you could be doing as a pre-law student, um, as, as whatever you can do to make your boss's life easier. <laughs> and the more of that that you do, the more likely it is for them to want to keep you around. Awesome. How do I find legal jobs and internships if my experience in the legal world is non-existent? <laughs> I get this question a lot. I have some thoughts on this too, so. Sure. It's always the kind of chicken and the egg, but I think that your flexibility, creativity, ability to build relationships is really key here because a lot of, you know, these kind of internship opportunities can be created for someone who evidence a certain level of passion for something and is honest about, look, I don't know how to be an attorney. I've never worked at a law firm, but I really want to work at your law firm. And here's why I've thought about it. I want to learn from you. You are a young attorney who runs a, a business and I'm really interested in entrepreneurship and business law, whatever, how you structure your pitch matters. And in order for you to structure it effectively, you've got to do research and you've got to be honest and all the things that, you know what I mean? We've been saying this entire time. So don't get lost in the, here's what I don't know. Present someone how eager you are to learn. Well, and and right now, I think that there are so many, you know, lawyers trying to navigate so many new technologies during COVID. We're trying to figure out social media marketing. We're trying to figure out um, podcasting. We're trying to figure out all sorts of things. And if you have some of these skills that you think you can contribute, um, especially to a small firm, that could mean the world. I had a you know student reach out to me over the summer, and she she told me you know flat out I don't have any experience in the legal world. I you know have been trying to apply for legal assistant jobs, can't get a single one because I don't have any experience but I really, really, really want to learn from a lawyer. And, um, you know, I've got some experience doing a lot of social media marketing. I've done some Instagram posts for this, you know, student organization that I'm in. And I also do um, stuff for this nonprofit that I'm involved in. And, you know, do you need some help with social media stuff? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I brought her on and then we started doing, um, I actually had a legal project come up where I wanted her to work on creating terms of use and a privacy policy and um, taught her how to do those things. And so like it turned in from social media, it moved to something more substantive. And so do whatever you can to get that experience, you know, get your foot in the door by blogging or doing social media work or whatever it is. Um, those things don't require any special legal skills. Um, let's see, do you have any tips for a lawyer who wants to switch fields of law? Oh, yes. This will be maybe another topic for conversation if Angie ever brings me back. So much of this is great, and I know we only have so much time, but this, this is really big for me, and I try to teach it at the pre-law level. I don't like the advice. Um, uh, you can do anything with a law degree. There is some truth in it, but the truth is also you're expected to have certain skill sets and there's a certain runway that starts from year one. So at year five, at year seven, you're expected to compete with others at year five and year seven. And so lateral moves are very difficult in our industry um, because starting like as a fifth year, let's say you go from five years as a civil attorney. There are certain expectations of what you should know at that point if you have the right level of experience and knowledge and you're expensive on the civil side. Your hourly rate usually is going up and up. Then you want a lateral move to let's say be a public defender, which was your passion. Some of the skills that you've built at that point might not be valuable to the PD's office. 
and now you're expensive. So do I compare you as an employer the same way I would a fifth year criminal um, PD from another you know, market? Or do I think of you as a first year and do I pay you that way? And so lateral moves are hard and I feel like there's a lot of BS around, you know, this is an easy thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. And so for those of you wanting to make a lateral move, this networking is huge. And I think it's especially huge if you're trying to make what I think is one of the biggest leaps from criminal to civil or civil to criminal. That's a really tough one to do. Not impossible, but who you know will matter. And there are certain stereotypes around what civil side lawyers are good at, what criminal lawyers are good at. And I don't agree with those stereotypes, but you're gonna have to fight them. So with friends of mine who have switched from criminal to civil, I think some of the uphill battles they face is this kind of general stereotype that, you know, maybe you're not gonna write as well as a senior civil side lawyer who's been doing more like, you know, gritty ivory tower style writing all the time. You have other skill sets that are valuable, but maybe something you have to overcome are some preconceived notions in whatever niche you're in um, about whatever other niche you're trying to get out of. So I think you, for, for folks making lateral moves, you've got to face those stereotypes, vet them out, ask people what they are, and do that networking in a huge way. Because I think a lot of times the people that I know who have been able to make the bigger leaps do it because somebody helped them open that door. Totally. I think that that's great candid advice. And I've found the same to be true that, you know, it's not as easy to switch as you think. Like people are like, oh, but you can just jump around and try a whole bunch of things. I'm like, no, you really can't. <laughs> um, because especially if you're planning to go to big law, I mean, they expect you to have a certain level of skills um, at every single you know year that you're moving up. And they have a very set um view of what they want a fifth year attorney to look like. And so um, you need to be very conscientious of that as you're, as you're moving up in your career. Because um, I know that for people who started at a boutique and then lateral to big law, that can be a really weird jump. And yeah. then same, you know, if you started, you know, at big law, and then you want to switch to launching your own firm, that can be a huge jump, right? Because <laughs> there's like a million things that you need to learn about business, the business of law, running your own firm, all of these things. And especially if you're in big law, you may have been insulated from all of those things. You don't have to do all of the administrative stuff yourself. So, um, so that can be a real challenge as well. Um, not to say that I haven't seen many people do it successfully, but it is more challenging than you might think. Um, okay, well, I know we're already a little bit over our time, so I don't wanna take up too much of Kristen's time, but thank you so much for being here, Kristen, and all of your great advice. I really, really appreciate it. And um, if, if you guys want to connect with Kristen afterwards, she dropped her LinkedIn link um, in the chat above. And I hope that you guys come back on Thursday. We have another event coming up. Um, and we actually have our virtual happy hour this week as well. So on Friday at 4 p.m., we have our virtual happy hour um, where we connect pre-law students, current law students, and lawyers. And you actually get to go into breakout rooms one-on-one -on -one and chat with each other and interact. And it's really, really fun. So. Come join us for our other events this week. And thank you so much, Kristen, for your time and all of your words of wisdom. Thank you so much for, for having me, Angie, and for what you're doing for our profession. This is an amazing resource, and it's one I wish I would have had as a student. So I look forward to sending more folks your way. And everyone on the line, you've got all my contact information there. I genuinely do uh, enjoy supporting fellow lawyers and law students and pre-law students. Please feel free to reach out if I can help you. Happy to do that. Thanks so much. All right. Bye, all.